Hi, I'm Pastor Mark, and in this video, I want to talk about worldviews, specifically the scientific worldview as implied by and arising from the scientific method. Uh, by worldview, I simply mean our uh, perspective upon the universe, upon reality, upon the world. Uh, you might say it's our particular version of reality. There have been times and places throughout human history when one particular worldview has become so dominant, so overwhelming, that it has crowded out all other worldviews. And I would refer to that type of worldview as totalitarian in nature or status. That's because it has totally captured the hearts and minds of the uh, community or society. There's also a scaled back uh, meaning that I want to apply to totalitarian in reference to a worldview. And, and that is that it's one individual who is so captured by a particular worldview that uh, he or she only sees the world in terms of that worldview. This implies, of course, it is possible to have more than one worldview at a time, even desirable. Uh, for example, uh, a woman can be a devout Roman Catholic in her private life, but then as uh, in her profession as a scientist, she can operate out of the scientific worldview. Now this doesn't mean that she's necessarily being inconsistent or irrational. If she does not review those worldviews as the fi final arbiter of reality, of what's real and not real, what's uh, good and bad, true and false, but instead see these worldviews as a kind of tools that should be used when appropriate. I mean, we would not use a hammer to unscrew something. We would use a screwdriver. In the same way, this woman um, uh, uses her religious worldview to render her life meaningful, give some sort of ethical framework by which to live her life. But then uh, when she's conversing with her colleagues or doing science, she would uh, use the scientific worldview. This idea of using uh, more than one worldview uh, in understanding of the world or living our life is nothing new or novel. Scientists of no less eminence as Albert Einstein actually advocated for, uh, in his uh, 1939 address to the Princeton Theological Seminary, where he recommended that we use science to ascertain the facts, while we, we use the religious worldview to ascertain a value and what ought to be. The evolutionary uh, biologist Stephen Jay Gould in his book Rock of Ages talks about two separate magisterium or sources of authority. One uh, is science, which is, has authority in determining what is real, what is true, what exists, while the magisterium of religion determines what ought to be and values, uh, morality. Today, however, there are very few scientists and uh, self-appointed spokespersons for science who would give this kind of concession to religion. Uh, people like Christopher Hitchens, Stephen Weinberg, Sam Harris, Richard Dawkins, all uh, advocate for the total elimination of the religious worldview in the populace at large, as well as in the, in the individual person and its substitution with a purely scientific worldview. And although they wouldn't use this word, I would describe what they are advocating is a, that the scientific uh, worldview acquire a totalitarian status for both for the individual and for the society. Now, there is no denying that historically religious worldviews have been haunted by their share of demons. Demons like patriarchy, superstition, and homophobia. And it's incumbent upon uh, those of us who want to retain these religious worldviews to exorcise the demons from them as best we can. But in this video, I'm going to argue that the scientific worldview has its own share of demons. Demons that are every bit as evil and dangerous as those of religion. Uh, demons that impoverish our understanding of uh, reality and our experiences. Demons that portend uh, a dystopian future for humanity. 
As I indicated earlier, the scientific worldview is implied by and arises from the scientific method. So if we want to find out what the scientific worldview is all about, we look at the scientific method. Many people just assume that the scientific method is just that. It's just a method we use to arrive at the facts, to ascertain the truth about, usually about natural phenomena. But it actually has its own set of assumptions. One of these assumptions is referred to by the philosophers of science as methodological atheism. And methodological atheism stipulates that uh, no matter what you might believe in your private life, that when doing science, you are forbidden to use God as a causative factor. For example, you're, if you hypothesize that God guides and directs uh, evolution, you are violating this methodological atheism. Now, what makes methodological atheism different from just plain outright denial of God's existence. I think the scientific method would allow a person to entertain other worldviews, like such as in their private life. But here I'm talking about the scientific worldview when it achieves a totalitarian status, that it is the one and only worldview for the individual and for society as a whole. In that case, there's really no difference between methodological atheism and just plain old atheism. Now, the, it's very important to understand here that atheism is not a conclusion that science comes to or that the scientific method arrives at. It is an assumption that the scientific method begins with. Not only is uh, the scientific method innately atheistic, but it's also innately nihilistic, devoid of any overarching source of meaning for life or the universe. And this is not because the scientific method is uh, trying to deceive us or make our life not worth living or meaningless. It's because the scientific method was never are meant to be used for that purpose. It is meant only to describe the world, not to prescribe uh, meaning or uh, morality. In other words, its purpose is descriptive in nature and not prescriptive in nature. As that great skeptic David Hume first put it, we cannot derive an ought from an is. Now, historically, people have looked to religion for that purpose, that is to determine the meaning of life and to uh, provide some kind of ethical framework to how they live. Although um, I will concede that there are uh, ostensibly secular ideologies like Marxism and humanism that also can provide a meaning to life and an ethical framework. But I would call them quasi-religious because they, they uh, provide meaning through the same way that religion does, and that is being some sort of meta-narrative to human history leading to some particular and desired goal, like the classless society, for example. It's important to understand, however, that the scientific worldview by itself does not do that. It does not provide an overarching meaning. And I, it's important, that point by itself is important because it, if it's supplemented by some other worldview of a religious or quasi-religious nature than it can. But if it has achieved a totalitarian status, as many spokespersons for science today advocate, then it is purely nihilistic. By itself, the, uh, the scientific worldview, the scientific method, uh, is not equipped to answers, answer questions of a ethical or religious nature. There is a third demon haunting scientific worldview and the scientific method that is more subtle and difficult to describe, but it's no less dangerous for the prospects of, of humanity. It has to do with the theory of knowledge or epistemology on which scientific worldview and scientific method is usually based upon epistemology that is often referred to as scientific realism. Scientific realism has a wholly quantitative understanding of what is real and not real, and dismisses qualitative 
descriptions of reality as being not really real. Let's take an, a quality of yellow, for example. According to the epistemology, the theory of knowledge of uh, scientific realism, the color yellow is simply a subjective representation of a certain frequency within the spectrum of visible light. And that, that is really a, a quantity, that is the, the number associated with that frequency, that uh, is real. The quality yellow is not real. Or maybe a, a better way to put it is not really real, since it is merely subjective. Consider all the qualities used to understand reality. I'm not just talking about qualities associated with our five senses, like uh, texture, color, tones, sense. Also, um, qualities that are a little more abstract in nature, such as uh, love, justice, spirituality, holiness, and beauty. According to the epistemology of scientific realism, none of these things are real. They're simply uh, illusions that we project upon reality, but do, do not actually exist in reality. Besides being morally and aesthetically objectionable, scientific realism doesn't really stand up to critical reasoning either. What makes uh, quantitative descriptions of reality any more objectively real than qualitative descriptions. Because think about it, what are quantitative statements? They're basically mathematical equations scribbled on a chalkboard. Uh, quantitative descriptions of reality are no more real than qualitative descriptions. They're just as subjective. In fact, even more subjective, they depend on the artifice of mathematics to be understandable. The late great Carl Sagan, in his last book, The Demon Haunted World, he provides a blistering critique of all those, what he would regard as superstitious worldviews, by, by which he means religious worldviews, that have wrought so much uh, suffering and error on humanity. And I can't deny that. However, in this video, I have argued that the scientific method and the scientific worldview implied in arising from that method has its own share of demons, specifically the three that I've described in this video. The innately atheistic character of, of the scientific worldview, the innately nihilistic character of that worldview, and the, the epistemology of the scientific worldview, is, which regards only quantitative statements equations uh, scribbled on a chalkboard as being objectively real. Everything else, uh, every other quality is unreal. Now this does not make the scientific method or scientific worldview bad or wrong or evil. It just means that by itself, the scientific worldview is inadequate in giving life meaning or, or providing an ethical framework to live by. Uh, but it never was meant to do that. But unfortunately, today and increasingly, a number of voices from the scientific community are advocating that the scientific worldview be the one and only worldview. But what I'm recommending here is not the elimination of the scientific method, God forbid, or even the elimination of the scientific worldview. What I'm advocating for here is a multiplicity of worldviews. Uh, different worldviews are necessary in different contexts. If we want to render life meaningful and the ethical framework by which to live, we use a, a religious or quasi-religious worldview. If we want to be purely descriptive of reality, then we would rely on uh, uh, more on the scientific worldview. In any case, uh, instead of worrying about whether these different worldviews are uh, compatible or not, or consistent or not, we should not regard any of them as final arbiters of reality, that none of them have monopoly on the, on the truth. Foolish consistency is the hobgoblin of little minds, adored by little statesmen, philosophers, and divines. You see, life is far too mysterious and multifaceted 
and profound for any one worldview to capture, do justice. I would hazard to, to guess that all the worldviews that have ever existed together are inadequate in describing the true nature of reality. Please consider liking this video and uh, subscribing to my YouTube channel, Uncommon Sense with Pastor Mark. Thank you and may God bless.